is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Nick Weiner from Open Channels. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, presenting for today's webinar on a toolkit for ecosystem service site-based assessment is Jenny Merriman from BirdLife International. I'll hand the mic over to her in just a sec to introduce herself. Uh, just to get everybody familiar with GoToWebinar, uh, there is a little chat box there on the right side. Uh, anything you type in the chat box will come to me, and then I can pass those questions on to Jenny at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you have any questions at all during the webinar, just pop them on in there, and we'll make sure that we uh, get those to Jenny at the end of the webinar. Uh, also, the webinar is being recorded. I'll have it up on openchannels.org in about an hour and a half after the webinar, in case you want to share this recording with anybody. Uh, and with that, Jenny, thank you so much for joining us today and presenting. I'll hand the webinar over to you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, and, and hello to everybody that's listening. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a tool um, that's been developed by a collaboration um, based mostly in the UK called the Toolkit for Ecosystem Service Site-Based Assessment, or TESSA for short. Um, so as Nick said, I work for BirdLife International, um, but have been involved in this tool since we started developing it with a number of other partners back in, in 2010, and currently I coordinate the, the continuation of the development of, of this tool. So as a brief overview then, um, TESSA is essentially guidance for low-cost methods on how to evaluate ecosystem services um, at site, so at site scale. So that might be protected areas or in case of bird life's interest, important bird and biodiversity areas, community forests or any other sort of deline delineated site. And the purpose of doing so to be able to inform and influence local or national decision making. The partners involved in the development of this toolkit um, are listed at the bottom of this slide. So we have two universities, um, Anglia Ruskin and the University of Cambridge, both based here in Cambridge in the UK, and then several NGO partners, so BirdLife RSPB, which is the UK BirdLife partner, the Tropical Biology Association, and the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Centre. We've also engaged a wide range of other organisations and individuals from those institutions, um, so I've put some of the logos on here or in terms of wider development, so we had a lot of expert workshops in the initial development of the methods and the framework, and then also a range of organizations actually implementing and, and piloting the tool. So it's, it's sort of reached beyond those core developers and, and has had input from a number of others. So obviously not a great deal of time to go into the detail of the tool, so I'm going to try and just focus on some of the sort of key concepts um, and the key steps involved in, in an ecosystem services assessment using TESSA. So first of all, what's this toolkit for? Um, so as I said, it's about site scale, low cost methodologies to assess ecosystem services and essentially to understand those benefits that people receive from sites, from nature and assess their value, that might be monetary or non-monetary, in order to generate information and to help with decision making. In terms of who the sort of target users are of this tool, we very much developed this with conservation practitioners in mind. Um, BirdLife works with um, national organizations all over the world, often with very limited funds, resources, time and capacity. So really we wanted to develop a tool that was different from some of those others out there um, and could really be used by people on the ground in the field with their local conservation groups. We recognize that um, the methods are applicable to a wide range of users beyond conservation practitioners, beyond NGOs, um, looking at government sectors, private sector, planners, and development organizations, to name a few. So this is obviously designed with conservation practitioners in mind, but, but with a wide potential audience. And on the next slide, I've just highlighted some of the key requirements. People are often interested to know exactly what kind of resources are required, both in terms of people's actual skills and, and um, equipment and so on. So obviously, ecosystem services is a, is a fairly complex idea and a concept that requires people to have some scientific training and understanding of how to apply methods, um, not just 
ecological or quantitative methods but also some sort of social science training is very helpful and some numeracy skills of course you're often dealing here with with numbers um, and being able to manipulate those is, is important um, in order to interpret them correctly resources wise we've tried to keep this very limited so um, as I said it's very much based on sort of field um, assessments so a computer's useful of course for data analysis one of the methods um, in the tool does require the use of an online modeling tool so that's why we've got here um, internet connection with, with an asterisk there some of the methods for example looking at the biomass in a forest requires some very simple field equipment and we provide a list of the things that people might need to carry out that method and also it's important that um, there's a sort of a small group of people implementing this in the field it would be very challenging I think for one individual to actually carry out this approach so I've highlighted the real key characteristics um, of TESSA here um, and I'll just run through those very quickly so making it accessible has been very important for us um, we've developed it as a downloadable guidance manual um, so that people can initially access it online but then can actually take it away put it on their laptops or whatever and, and use it in the field we try to keep the methods very low cost it doesn't need a huge amount of technical input um, or equipment or software or anything like that it's very um, focused on trying to do things in a participatory way so a lot of sort of guidance on how you might engage stakeholders in the process how to actually involve people in data collection and also in interpreting results and then using that information themselves for, for their own benefit um, afterwards it's relatively rapid compared to some other methods out there yet we've remained um, core, core to the scientific methods so trying to keep it obviously robust and credible um, and for that reason we have actually published several peer review papers to, to get that credibility behind the tool we initially focus on producing biophysical data and guiding people through how they would do that but also then take that next step to show people how they could do an economic valuation of the ecosystem services using that, that biophysical data I've already mentioned about site scales so that's just to give you a guide of what we roughly consider would be an appropriately sized site for an assessment and comparative valuation I'll actually come on to um, in a couple of slides time as I want to explain that in a, in a bit more detail so I've tried to map um, Tessa onto a chart here with some of the other well-known tools that are available for ecosystem service assessment this isn't an exclusive list there certainly will be others out there that I'm sure many of you are aware of but essentially this is just to show that we were really trying to to add to this range of tools um, not compete with any of the others but to really complement what else is out there so we have focused on trying to develop something that has a relatively low time demand and for people with limited technical expertise whereas some of the other modeling tools are perhaps in on the other side of the spectrum in the top right hand corner there and these are the key aspects of, of Tessa here on, on the side so collecting field data so using real primary data to get local information um, so we, we try not to um, steer people towards sort of benefit transfer approaches but to actually collect data from from their sites um, and it's not a sort of spatial tool so it sort of negates the need for for any kind of knowledge around sort of GIS systems um, or any complex modeling so I've got two slides then on sort of the key purpose um, of the tool and this first one is around the idea of change which comes back to that comparative valuation bullet point on an earlier slide so really what the core concept of, of TESSA is is to be able to value ecosystem services from a site and compare those to some alternative state of that same site so it's not about understanding gross values but more about what impact a potential or a real change would have on those values 
So I think that's where it differs from perhaps some of the other tools available or some of the other methods that people use in that it's really about looking at change in order to inform a decision because of course decisions are always between one or other option and so if you can provide information on, on what that um, what the impact of, of making that decision is then it then it's more useful so the example here is from um, a mountain in in the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal showing a native forest and then potentially the um, change if if there was subsistence agriculture encroaching onto that forest and we would here be interested in looking at the ecosystem service values of the forest as the forest and then looking at the alternative values under the subsistence agriculture scenario. The second core concept um, that we focus very much on is about thinking about beneficiaries. So again, this is something that occasionally other tools don't necessarily focus on um, and it's really thinking about the distribution of benefits. So again, ecosystem services are the benefits that people get from nature. It's not an ecosystem service unless people are benefiting in some way. That can be a sort of tangible or an intangible benefit. But essentially understanding who benefits from these different services, what the reasons are for that, so there'll be social, political and ecological factors um, behind that. And then when you change any, a site and change the ecosystem service benefits that people receive, what does that mean for different groups of people, perhaps local people, um, maybe men or women or different ethnic groups? What does it mean for tourism interest from the global community? Um, just understanding that relationship between services and, and beneficiaries. So obviously um, it's very difficult for a rapid tool to cover everything in terms of ecosystem services scope. We um, had advice from a range of experts on which services would be best to focus on and we chose the ones that they felt were applicable in a variety of global contexts and also possibly the ones where we knew there were methods out there, practical methods, that people could actually assess them at, at the site scale. So the current version of, of TESA that's publicly available has um, five sets of ecosystem service groups included. There's cultivated goods, global climate regulation, harvested wild goods, water in terms of both provision and quality, and nature-based recreation, and that includes um, tourism under that category. In the last couple of years, we've been exploring developing new modules. So we currently have a cultural module that's being piloted by um, a few projects. We're hoping to develop um, a coastal protection module, so that's looking at the benefits of um, vegetation on coastlines for protecting communities and infrastructure um, from storm events and also potentially looking at pollination and whether it's possible to have a sort of rapid approach to um, assessing the value of pollination from a site. In terms of format, um, it's essentially uh, at the moment a PDF that you download from the website. I'll give you the link at the end of the presentation. It, we've made it as interactive as we, as we can, so there's quite a few sort of hyperlinks in there. There's a lot of linked files to extra guidance materials, so they'll all flow, um, and I'll show you the, the decision tree on the next slide. And then you can go from that decision tree to the various methods, the various additional guidance, the worked examples. There's a few links to um, actual audio webinars and things in there as well to help people actually go through the process of doing the assessment. So this is um, on one of the initial pages of the of the toolkit um, which shows you the sort of step-by-step -step approach. Um, the text is probably quite small but I'll focus on each of these as we go through the rest of the presentation. Essentially, the main take-home message from, from this slide is that stakeholder engagement is throughout 
the process, so not just you know a workshop at the beginning, but actually being on the ground and working with people through each of those stages um, so that any information that's generated by the tool has the better chance of, of actually being taken up by local people through you know having their own ownership and also um, integrating it into decision systems. So I just run through each of those sort of stages to give you an idea of um, how you would actually carry out an assessment using the TESSA guidance. So first of all, there would be a sort of scoping stage, which is often you know a key group of of stakeholders coming together and exploring some of the issues around the site. So defining the objective of undertaking the assessment, identifying who are the key stakeholders to involve in the project, and exploring some of those. Um, the local context, so what you know, what's the social, political, and ecological context of the site? What are some of the issues, um, and how might those impact some of the ecosystem services? Then also very early on, we encourage people to really engage with decision making. So ecosystem services assessments are generally done in order to inform some kind of decision and as part of a bigger process. So understanding how your assessment fits into that decision-making process is absolutely critical so that the results are then useful. So we provide some information on how to go about understanding what the decision-making processes are at the local level, what the opportunities are to actually engage with that and in order to, to use the data um, to actually inform those processes. We then have something which I guess you'd call step one of TESSA, which is a preliminary scoping appraisal. And this is um, following a kind of step-by-step -step format of background information, really, background information gathering from a wide group of stakeholders. So it's designed to understand which are the important ecosystem services um, from a site, both from a sort of scientific perspective, but also from from sort of local stakeholders identifying what they feel is valuable and then also going on to think about how those ecosystem services might change. So what are the threats around the site? What's the particular development um, that's happening or, or you know, what's the, the change going on at the moment? So there's an example here from a recent um, study that one of the BirdLife partners did in the Dominican Republic last year. It's a fairly large national park called Sierra de Baruco, which is just over 100,000 hectares in size. And it has a sort of clear distinction between the more, I guess, pristine area um, to the north of that red line that you can see going through the middle, and an area that's been more degraded to the southwest. And the context here is that it is a national park, so there's a policy in place to protect it, but on the ground, you know, there isn't really the capacity to enforce that. The boundary is not clear to people. There's a lot of illegal activity going on and exploitation of, of the forest resources by various different people living in and around the area. So the um, conservation organization in Dominican Republic held a stakeholder meeting um, in order to do this preliminary scoping appraisal, um, invited various different stakeholders as you can see named there. Um, obviously in reality it's not possible to invite everybody to these meetings quite often for various reasons, so they've also highlighted here where it wasn't possible to involve people. Um, but essentially they tried to get as many as they could together to actually review what's going on in the site and to get them to identify some of the key issues and ecosystem services. So the output of that process, it's a, it's a workshop, often takes about one day to actually get through everything, um, is to identify the key ecosystems in the site, to link the key ecosystem services with those and to prioritize them. So there's a sort of ranking exercise that people go through to then identify what the threats are to those services and to the site and, and the drivers of change. So here very much production of charcoal, logging and agricultural expansion. 
and also to think about who the current beneficiaries are. So different users with different values um, depending differently on, on those ecosystem services. So using that information then, the next step is to think about this idea of the alternative state. So this is coming back to the comparative valuation concept. And that can be done in a variety of ways. It can be done in that large stakeholder group. It can be done with a smaller group of people, perhaps just the core project team. Um, but the idea is to come up with a plausible and a realistic alternative. So you know, if there's currently encroachment going on, thinking about in 10 years' time what that scale of encroachment might be, and actually mapping that out. So in this example here for the forest in Nepal that I showed earlier, there's a group of um, local people, and I think the warden here as well, actually showing where land use change might occur and how much it might actually affect the community forest. And so what you actually get then in order to do your assessment would be um, a table of land use for your current state. So in this case here, mostly forest um, and no bare ground grassland, cropland or built up areas. And this idea of what might change. So in red here, you can see that a lot of the forest would become degraded, cropland would be introduced with bare ground and also some built up areas. And many of the services can then be mapped onto this kind of area based process. In terms of collecting the actual data, which would then be the next step, um, the idea of the alternative state means that you would collect data at potentially two or more different locations. So this diagram here shows the mountain on the left being your actual site of interest, so your assessment site, the, the forest in this case, and then thinking about the alternative that you've just come up with, so encroachment from, from crops and some built up area, finding somewhere else nearby that's representative of that um, and actually taking measurements there for your comparison. So in this example here, there might be a hill next to the one that you're interested in on the same side of the valley where encroachments already occurred and you could actually extrapolate the values from that site in order to understand the impact of that change on ecosystem services. So methods is obviously important um, and something that distinguishes TESSA I think from a lot of the other sort of guidance, participatory guidance that's out there is that it does provide people with methods um, and actually instructions on how to go about carrying those out. So it's much more um, specific than just saying what you could do. It has a whole section for each of those ecosystem services I mentioned earlier on different methods that you could use in different situations in different habitats. And a lot of those methods also have worked examples so that you can actually see how the calculations are done as well. So we've really tried to make it as easy as possible for people to actually be able to pick this up and apply the methods in the field without having to go elsewhere to look for information or to have additional training, for example. So here this is just um, from one of the sites in the black boxes showing which methods were chosen for which service um, and just to highlight really the diversity of approaches that you could use and the way that you could integrate those into an assessment. So using published secondary data um, from reliable sources might be the only feasible thing to do perhaps for looking at global climate regulation if you haven't got time to go out and measure the vegetation and the biomass in a forest for example you could potentially look for other studies that have done so. Some of the water services and equally some of the um, goods there you could do through stakeholder workshops, through household questionnaires or focus group interviews in order to get data directly from people who are benefiting from those ecosystem services. And then also here you'll see there's a modelling tool um, which was used in this case for looking at water use and that's because water can be quite complex um, to do in a sort of rapid way in the field and to get around that we have added into TESSA um, Waterworld, which is another tool 
that's available um, open access that people can use to remotely look at how water services might change with land use change. So a variety of ways that you can actually carry out methods in order to um, do the full assessment. The toolkit has um, a chapter for each of the services and at the beginning of that chapter will be a flow chart. Um, again, this is really just for illustration, so don't worry if you can't read the detail here. But essentially, we've tried to lead people through a step-by-step -step decision tree in order to send them to the most appropriate method for their context. So in this case, if you've got resources to carry out local surveys, depending on the type of habitat you're in, there is a method in TESSA that you could follow in order to collect that data. And the example here is a forest in Vietnam where they're actually looking at the diameter at breast height of that tree in order to estimate the carbon in the forest of interest. It's the second example here just to show you a different service. So this is the um, looking at harvested wild goods and again here going through a decision tree with a bit of guidance on, on how you might actually identify the most important wild goods to focus on and then how you collect data on those from individual harvesters and for the alternative state. So one of the things that we've um, very much tried to encourage through our own use of TESSA is actually carrying out the work within the local community and having them really kind of engage with the process, understand the purpose of doing the assessment and actually build up some of their skills in being able to um, look at the benefits that they get from, from their own areas. So here we've got um, people in the Dominican Republic learning how to estimate carbon stock in the forest, which potentially could be of use in future, especially if sort of red plus schemes come in and people are required to actually monitor the carbon in their community forests. And also um, local NGOs being able to understand how you might look at tourism value, for example, by interviewing people and asking questions about how much they spend um, in order to visit a site. So the most important thing really then is how you actually communicate um, the results of the assessment and how they feed into decision making processes. And we do include um, some content in TESSA on how you might analyze and communicate the results in a way that is holistic. So not just kind of focusing on one service at a time, but actually the, the bigger picture of, of what a change in an ecosystem might mean. Um, for ecosystem services and people who benefit. So one of the important steps is of course to report back to everybody who's been involved in the process on the actual data um, that's been gathered, what that potentially might mean, and inviting people to comment and in interpret that information. And obviously one of the key challenges is actually putting that data in a form that is useful and accessible for the people that you're trying to talk to. So it depends who your target audience is and how you actually present that back. And some of the, the partners involved in the project have come up with some, some fairly um, good ways to do that because they have um, a relationship with, with the countries that they're working in and they know much better than somebody like me how you might communicate that in an appropriate way. So I have just put a few examples on here, um, which are mainly taken from sort of scientific um, outputs, so for one particular group of audiences. Um, so here you might be able to show, for example, the difference in overall economic value of your community forest versus an unprotected forest um, by just adding up the economic values of the services that you've assessed. And here you can see that based on the services that were included in the assessment, the community forest brings more economic benefit than if it wasn't managed by the local community. So that's one way of showing the results. Another way which um, avoids having to put economic values 
on to the ecosystem services is something like this, which is called a rose plot. So here you're just again looking at the same two scenarios. On the left is the community forest, on the right is the non-community forest, which is effectively the situation where you've got um, subsistence agriculture and some built up land. So the example from Nepal that I showed earlier. And the difference in services between the two. So on the left, if they've got a full um, pizza slice, I guess, there, then it means that the service is being delivered better in that state than in the other. And the degree to which that pizza slice is filled shows you how much of that service has been lost, essentially. So in this example, um, four of the six services are greater in the community forest. Cultivated goods is clearly benefiting communities in the alternative state and not in the current state. And there's very limited impact, perhaps no effect, in terms of water provision there. But overall, you can see the difference in terms of the balance of services between the two different land uses. And then finally, just a very simple table here, which shows this idea of looking at different groups of beneficiaries. So you've got the ecosystem services that have been assessed and who benefits from those. So in this case, sort of quite simply broken into local, national, global, with negative signs meaning that they lose out, um, equal signs meaning that, meaning that there's no change, and then a positive symbol meaning that they benefit. And from this, you can see that the national beneficiaries um, have a better deal if you convert the forest to agriculture. And actually, looking at all of the services as a whole, local and global beneficiaries lose out. So just to wrap up then with a few slides. Um, so the tool has been developed by those organizations I mentioned at the beginning. It's been piloted by us fairly extensively. And this slide shows some of those, probably most of those sites where we have been involved in actually trying out the tool and learning um, and revising it as a result of those assessments. It's also obviously been downloaded by people from all over the world and perhaps applied at, a, at a many other sites that, that we're not currently um, aware of, but these are the ones that we have had direct involvement in. And we've also been exploring um, capacity development through training programs. Um, there's quite a good level of interest in um, having a sort of core four or five day workshop on TESA before applying it. I think people feel that you know, they can perhaps um, benefit much more from, from doing that. So we have run some training um, jointly between the Tropical Biology Association and BirdLife in Kenya, um, where we actually had 16 people trained and then they applied the tool at a site in their country and then came back 10 months later to actually feed back on, on that and to discuss some of the issues and the challenges and also the benefits in terms of um, influencing local policy through using the tool. And we've done another couple of sort of smaller workshops um, in different countries and I think it's something that we potentially will explore as a TESA partnership going, um, going into the future. So there's plenty more information available um, on the website, so I've tried to put the links there for you. Um, you can access information on TESA through the BirdLife website. You can go directly to the latest version from the tessa.tools website or using that uh, QR code there. Um, there is an email address um, for inquiries, although I have to say we have very limited capacity, so it's not really checked that frequently. So don't rely on that. Rely on the, um, the information that's available online. And if anybody's interested in any of the publications um, in the scientific literature, I've just put three um, up there, and there are also a few more um, being published this year. 
so I think I'll stop there and allow people plenty of time to ask for questions or clarifications. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, so just a quick note, uh, to open up the GoToWebinar control panel, there's a little orangish red arrow in the top right of your screen. If you click that, that should slide out the control panel. And uh, there's a questions box in there. Uh, just type any questions you have in the questions box. Uh, we have a few in here already. Uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, Jenny, there's one question here. Um, it seems that a lot of the methodology and steps that you used in TESSA uh, are very similar for the science policy process and engagement. Uh, so when mm -hmm. you bring TESSA to new places where stakeholders and other people already like bought into the, the stakeholder engagement process, uh, can you adapt, ad sorry, adapt the TESSA framework to their understanding and terminology? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things I omitted to say actually was that it is designed to be adapted to the local context. So although we've sort of tried to be um, fairly explanatory in the guidance and in the methods, we do say that obviously every location is different and that people should adapt it as they see most appropriate. So I think where people are already you know, fully engaged in the stakeholder processes, understand all of that sort of foreground stuff, then, yeah, you could kind of just um, bring in the aspects of, of TESSA that are, that are most relevant and in the way that, that works best for you. Excellent. Uh, so we have another question here on uh, nature-based tourism services. Uh, how do you estimate the number of beneficiaries? Uh, in this particular, specific example that this questioner is asking, um, they have a range of anywhere between 10,000 to 200,000 a year and like how do you kind of reconcile that huge range when you put that into TESSA? Yeah, um, so there's sort of two methods in TESSA that deal with nature-based tourism and it depends on the type of site you have. So one of the easier sites is perhaps something like a nature reserve where there's an entrance gate or there's a fee paid and there's a record of how many people benefit directly from actually visiting the site. Um, and I should say that w when we talk about nature-based tourism, we are talking about actual visitation. We're not sort of talking about the value of the site beyond people that actually use it in this context. Um, it becomes more tricky where you have an area where perhaps there's more informal visitation, recreation, walking, that kind of thing. Um, and there's no specific way of capturing the number of people. So there is a method that's like a bit of a census um, in order to take a random sample of numbers of people on different days during your survey and do that in a, repre in a representative way so that you can estimate over any one year how many people might be coming to the site. I mean, obviously, there's lots of caveats with that and assumptions required, but you know, that's one of the approaches that, that we have a method for, um, for those kind of sites. I hope that answers the question. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. I think that was perfect. Um, do you know if anybody's used TESSA for coral reef ecosystems or beach ecosystems? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so we've had one person um, use it for mangrove uh, coastal ecosystem in Madagascar. They found it quite challenging because obviously in the marine environment there's a whole range of other issues around ecosystem service flows and, and the sort of spatial relationship um, with those benefits. So we are sort of thinking about more development in terms of applicability in the coastal environment. Um, as far as I know, nobody's used it for coral reefs. Um, I mean, it would have limited use, I think, at the moment. I mean, if you were looking at sort of fishing, um, then that would be possible. Um, and again, in terms of sort of mangroves, we're interested in how we can adapt the carbon method for a mangrove ecosystem. It's quite different um, to actually survey mangroves than it is to survey terrestrial forest. Um, so yes, I mean, the answer is no, I don't know of anybody, but we are aware that potentially there could be value in, in looking at coastal um, sites more generally using TESSA. Sweet. Uh, so follow up to that, uh, do you know if there's anybody that's been using it for urban ecosystems? <laughs> um, again, none of us involved in the development have used it for um, urban ecosystems and I 
don't think anybody who's downloaded it, I do occasionally cast my eye over what people are using it for, I don't think anybody has. Um, it would be very interesting to explore how useful it would be in an urban environment. I think some of the modules would be um, relevant, but then some of the others less so. So I think, again, you know, it's something that people could adapt for an urban environment, but they may need to sort of go elsewhere for some perhaps methods to, to look at other services that we haven't included. Excellent. Uh, there's also a question here if you could clarify if you need uh, GIS information when you're doing TESSA. Yeah, so no, you don't need it. Um, so it's very much tried to steer away from the spatial um, aspects of ecosystem service assessments. It's always beneficial to have additional information, particularly kind of maps to share in workshops so that people know that the boundaries of the site that you're talking about, you know, they, they feel a bit more engaged perhaps with being able to sort of point out different um, places of interest and that kind of thing. But there's no um, requirement for actually doing anything in terms of GIS using TESSA. Excellent. Uh, do you know if there's any case studies of TESSA being used by developers, uh, i.e. people conducting assessments for requirements for planning uh, a consenting system? Um, yeah, so we have a, I don't know of any specific case studies, but I do know that TESSA has been um, downloaded by a number of commercial users. Um, so we basically allow anybody to use TESSA as long as they um, tell us what they're using it for. Um, so potentially there are developers out there who are using it as part of an EIA process or something similar, um, but we're not actually tracking that use at the moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be aware of any, any specific examples. Excellent. Uh, so there's a question here about how do you measure and incorporate uncertainty into TESSA? That's another good question. Um, so we have a uh, guidance note on issues around data, bias, uncertainty, um, reliability, limitations, all that kind of thing. And as part of that, we have tried to develop a sort of traffic-like classification system for people to apply to their own approach. Um, so essentially giving them an idea of what it means to have a green traffic light for your data, um, you know, in terms of sampling and, and um, all that kind of thing. And then, you know, which approaches might give you a red, which means that, you know, you can have much less confidence in the results um, and need to be a bit cautious with how you actually use any numbers that you present. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely aware that, you know, with something that's fairly rapid, um, sometimes uncertainty can be an issue and, and confidence in the results perhaps less. So yeah, we have tried to sort of bring that in so that people can do a self-assessment of of the, um, the uncertainty around the data they collect. Excellent. Um, let's see, do you know if TESA is applicable to environmental cleanup or and restoration or is it more of a conservation preservation type tool? Um, so you could definitely use it for restoration because that's that kind of classic example of an alternative state. So you know, if you're interested in in restoring something, um, a site or a habitat, then you know, understanding the benefits that you get from it in its unrestored state versus potentially what you get from a restored state would would be very relevant and appropriate. And that has been done by the RSPB, one of the TESA partners, um, in terms of looking at uh, quarries at the end of their life cycle and restoration options of how you might then use that land, you know, do you turn it into farmland or a nature reserve or a park or something, um, and looking at the alternative values associated with those. Um, environmental cleanup, I'm not so sure about. Um, I mean, I'm not really familiar with, with that um, myself, so I would say no, but <laughs> people might know more than me on that. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, do you know if anyone at BirdLife has used TESSA to quantify ecosystem service values with birds? 
Um, no, so you wouldn't do that using Tessa because Tessa is very much based around looking at sites um, and the way in which we connect that with birds or biodiversity is by looking at the value of sites where birds and high biodiversity exists. Um, so we focus very much on our network of 12,000 important bird and biodiversity areas. Um, we know they're already valuable for biodiversity, so you know we're just looking at the, the sort of human benefits, I guess, um, from those sites. Obviously, there are studies out there that look at the kind of direct economic value of different species, um, vultures, birds as pest control, that kind of thing. Um, but that's not something that we've done, and we wouldn't do it through Tessa. Perfect. Uh, so there's a question here on um, your thoughts in applying Tessa where you have multiple value sets based on different subgroups in a community, and what are the kind of like best practice recommendations for doing so? Yeah, um, that's quite a complicated issue. So um, perhaps one of the most appropriate links here is to our cultural services module, which is currently being piloted, um, which is quite different from some of the modules that we've got currently in Tessa, obviously, you know, you know that there's a certain amount of carbon in a tree, so measuring carbon in a forest is much more tangible than understanding how different people value a site culturally. Um, so yeah, multiple values I think would sort of come into our cultural assessment, um, and I mean that's sort of not finalised at the moment, but it's it's very much more exploratory in terms of understanding people's connections with the environment that they're living in, um, asking them to kind of elicit those cultural values of the site um, based on sort of various um, participatory ap approaches. So I guess at the moment the version that we've got. Um, probably doesn't have a great deal of guidance on how you get people's individual values um, into a TESSA assessment, but I think when the cultural services um, module becomes available, then it might cover that in, in a bit more detail. Is that available in a beta right now, or do you have a, a, like a plan launch date for that? Yeah, well, well I mean, next year um, it will be available, but exactly when I'm not sure, it sort of depends a bit on um, when we get the feedback in and how long it takes to actually revise um, the module and then obviously put it in the format that it needs to be in to release um, as part of TESSA. Excellent. Uh, gosh, we still have a bunch of questions here and thank you so much for getting through all these so quickly. <laughs> uh, do you know of any of assessments that have included endangered species or critical habitat? Um, well, so it depends what you mean by those terms. Um, so all of the assessments I've been involved in with BirdLife Partners have involved, um, well, probably endangered species because they've been carried out at IBAs, so important bird and biodiversity areas, and those are classified according to a set of criteria, one of which is does it contain globally threatened um, species. So the short answer is probably yes. Um, critical habitat, I think, has a very specific definition, and I'm not exactly sure what that is. But again, you know, in terms of a biodiversity value point of view, um, where we've applied it at important bird and biodiversity areas or protected areas, um, then yes, you know, it has been done. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, what about energy production? As an ecosystem service, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> so it's not, I guess, explicitly included. I mean, one of the main harvested wild goods that we come across in almost every site is the use of, of fuel wood or charcoal for mm. producing energy. Um, so in that sense, it's included. We haven't included it in the broader concept, perhaps, you know, looking at things like uh, hydropower and biofuels and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess there's various ways you could kind of adapt some of these approaches, but for now we've kind of stuck with what we feel is most relevant at most of the sites in which conservation practitioners work. Sweet. 
Uh, there's a question here if you can add services specific to your needs. Uh, so like, can you kind of like open up Tessa and add on to it? Yeah, I mean, you know, we certainly wouldn't restrict people from from doing that. Um, essentially, we've provided something that we feel is useful as an initial first step, um, and obviously it's got quite a lot of limitations to that. So if people have um, knowledge of other methods for other services, then, you know, they could be integrated. I guess the key thing is the... Um, the sort of concept of Tessa is about valuing change, so it probably wouldn't really make sense to add in a service where you're just looking at the value of that service as it is. You'd need to then think about how you would value the alternative um, state for that service in order to kind of integrate it fully as, as part of a Tessa assessment. Excellent. Uh, there's also a question here that's like related to getting data into Tessa. Uh, how would you ensure consistent field data collection methods uh, for benchmarking the data that you have collected? Um, so I think that's about making sure you've got a good team who know what they're doing. Um, so, I mean, ideally you would have a very clear idea of how you wanted to gather the data for your project. Um, and the people who were actually gathering that information were aware of what some of the issues are around um, inconsistencies with data and you know issues of bias and that kind of thing. So yeah, I think just making sure you have a, a good strategy, a clear process and sound science um, in that, then, then you can have confidence in, in the data. We do have a guidance note on sampling um, in terms of, you know, how do you pick an appropriate sample and how do you know when you've got enough samples and, and that kind of thing to help people with that specific issue. Excellent. Uh, well, with that, if there's any other questions, uh, please type them in now. I think we've gotten to just about everything that's on the list here. Oh, it looks like everything that's left we've already touched on, um, except for this one. Uh, do you know if there's any... Uh, Examples of Tessa being used on the in North America, uh, specifically on the West Coast. Um, no. So I mean, I haven't been involved any. I don't think the BirdLife partners in that region have. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't think of any. But we've had, you know, two thousand or so downloads. So quite possibly, some people from that region have at least accessed it um, and potentially used it. Um, but, but yeah, we don't really, we don't monitor, obviously, um, everybody that uses the tool. Mm. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking all your time to do this webinar with us. Um, That's okay. Oh, uh, actually, there is one question here that I missed. Sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> uh, has Tessa been used in natural resource damage assessment cases? Not as far as I know. Um, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we have certainly picked your brain clean, I think. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you again so much for doing this webinar with us. Uh, everyone, this okay. will be archived. I'll have it up on openchannels.org slash webinars in about an hour. Uh, so you want to download a copy and share it with your colleagues, you can do so there. And uh, thank you all for joining us. We will see you on the next webinar then. Have a good night. <laughs>